In this lesson, we will discuss how to write names and chemical formulas for ionic compounds that contain polyatomic ions. Please have your periodic table, note sheet, and list of polyatomic ions handy. We have already discussed how to write names and chemical formulas for binary ionic compounds. These are ionic compounds that contain two elements, a metal and a nonmetal. But ionic compounds can also contain polyatomic ions. The prefix poly means many. So this is an ion that is made of many atoms. These atoms are covalently bonded, but overall they carry a charge. We drew Lewis dot structures for polyatomic ions. Most polyatomic ions are negatively charged. So most polyatomic ions will be paired with a cation, something that is positively charged. When we write the chemical formula for an ionic compound that contains a polyatomic ion, we're going to want to make sure that we never change the chemical formula for the polyatomic ion. We want to be able to recognize it as a certain polyatomic ion. Listed here are some common polyatomic ions you will find them in bold letters on your polyatomic ion reference sheet. Most polyatomic ions have an A-T-E or I-T-E ending, like carbonate has an A-T-E ending and nitrite has an I-T-E ending. There are a few polyatomic ions that have an I-D-E ending, like hydroxide, this IDE ending may lead you to believe that the anion is a nonmetal. So watch out for hydroxide and other polyatomic ions that end in IDE. To write a chemical formula for an ionic compound that contains a polyatomic ion, we use the same method that we use for the binary ionic compounds. We're going to crisscross our charges and they will become our subscripts. So we have sodium carbonate. Sodium has a plus one charge, and then carbonate with the A-T-E ending should clue you in to the fact that it's a polyatomic ion. It's CO3 with a minus two charge. So when we crisscross these charges to get our subscripts, we end up with Na2 and then CO3. That's our chemical formula for sodium carbonate. In lithium hydroxide, lithium is a plus one charge, and then hydroxide with the IDE ending again may lead you to believe that it is a non-metal. However, this is a polyatomic ion. It's OH with the minus one charge. And when we crisscross our charges, we are left with Li O H. In each of these examples, we have just one polyatomic ion in each chemical formula. But what if we want to indicate more than one polyatomic ion in the chemical formula? When this happens, we're going to put parentheses around the polyatomic ion. For example, magnesium hydroxide. Magnesium is a plus two charge. And here's hydroxide again with a minus one charge. And when we crisscross our charges, we're going to want to have two hydroxides. So we put the hydroxide in parentheses and then the two goes outside. In lead two carbonate, Lead has a plus two charge, and carbonate with that A-T-E ending should clue you in to the fact that it's a polyatomic ion, CO3 with a minus two charge. Now when we crisscross our charges, we get Pb2CO3-2. However, this is not the simplest ratio of ions in the compound. So we can take each of these subscripts and divide them by two. 
and we're left with just PbCO3. Here you do not need the parentheses around the polyatomic ion because we have only one of the polyatomic ions. In tin 4 sulfite, tin has a plus 4 charge, and sulfite with this ITE ending shows us it's a polyatomic ion. It's SO3 with a negative 2 charge. When we crisscross these charges, we get SN2, SO3, 4. This again is not the simplest ratio of ions in the compound. We have a 2 to 4 ratio. We can simplify that to SN, SO3, 2. And in the last example, we have ammonium phosphate. Ammonium is the only positively charged polyatomic ion that's on our list. And phosphate has an ATE ending, so that indicates a polyatomic ion. It's PO4 with a negative 3 charge. Once we crisscross our charges, we put the ammonium in parentheses with the 3 outside, and then the phosphate does not need parentheses because we're going to have just one of the phosphate polyatomic ions. When we name ionic compounds that have polyatomic ions in them, all we do is write down the name of the polyatomic ion. There is no spelling change for the name of a polyatomic ion. So in the first example, we have Ca, which is calcium, and then we have CO3 which is carbonate. We know that there has to be a polyatomic ion in this compound because it's not binary. It's not made of two elements. It's made of three elements. So somewhere in there has to be a polyatomic ion. Most polyatomic ions are negatively charged, or anions, so it's often best to look at the back half of the compound for the polyatomic ion. In the next example, you see the parentheses. So the only thing that you have inside the parentheses is a polyatomic ion. So that's a good clue. Our first element, though, is chromium. Chromium is a transition metal with more than one possible charge. So we are going to want to indicate the charge using a Roman numeral. And that charge is plus 3. And then our polyatomic ion is called sulfate. In the next example, we have aluminum. Aluminum does not need a Roman numeral because it always has a plus 3 charge. Inside our parentheses, we'll have a polyatomic ion. And if you look that one up, it's called acetate. In the next example, we have iron. Iron is a transition metal with more than one possible charge. So it is going to need a Roman numeral. And that's going to be a 2. And then in the parentheses, we have a polyatomic ion, hydroxide. In the next example, in parentheses, we have a polyatomic ion, ammonium. And then just oxygen, which we call oxide. And in the last example, lead. It's not a transition metal, but it does have more than one possible charge, so it will need a Roman numeral. And that's a 4. The polyatomic ion, in parentheses, has two names. I usually use bicarbonate. To end with, let's just make sure 
we understand how to interpret the subscripts when we have a polyatomic ion in our chemical formula. If we look at this chemical formula, we can see that we have three magnesiums. And we have two of these phosphates. But how many phosphorus and oxygen atoms do we have? Think the distributive property like in algebra. We have two phosphorus and eight oxygen. And finally, it's important to be able to distinguish ionic compounds from molecular or covalent compounds so that you know how to name them properly or write the chemical formula properly. With ionic compounds, remember we can look for binary ionic compounds made of a metal and a nonmetal, or we can look for what we call ternary or tertiary compounds that contain the polyatomic ions. So our first example has CO2, that's two nonmetals, so that would not be ionic. The second one has calcium, a metal, and chlorine, a nonmetal, so that would be ionic. The third one has cobalt, a metal, a transition metal, and chlorine, a nonmetal, so that would be ionic. The fourth example has three elements in it, so somewhere there has to be a polyatomic ion, and actually it's the nitrate here at the end of the compound, and a polyatomic ion indicates an ionic compound. The fifth example has two nonmetals, so that would be a covalent or molecular compound. And the last example has more than two elements in it, and actually it has two polyatomic ions in it, ammonium and hydroxide. So that will be ionic as well. So now you hopefully know how to write the names and chemical formulas for ionic compounds that contain polyatomic ions. If not, please go back and re-watch this video.